Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. In the previous video, we talked about the vagus nerve and all of its branches and functions in the neck region and the thoracic cavity. Now we're going to switch gears and talk about its functions in the abdominal and the pelvic cavities. So obviously, in order for the vagus nerve to have any function in the abdominal cavity, it's going to have to move from the thoracic into the abdominal cavity, but there's a problem, and that's the diaphragm. The diaphragm not only serves as the major inspiratory muscle, but if you've taken any A&P classes recently, you know that it also serves as a boundary or barrier between the thoracic and the abdominal cavities. So how does the vagus nerve actually get into the abdominal cavity? Well, here... We're actually looking at an inferior view of the diaphragm. That's what this muscle is right here. So you actually see the xiphoid process of the sternum here anteriorly. Here's the bottom of the ribs. And then back here is the spine. Here you see the abdominal aorta. And there's a couple of holes right here. Each of these holes is what we refer to as a hiatus. A hiatus is a large hole that basically allows large structures to move between the thoracic and abdominal cavities. This one over here would be the hiatus of the vena cava, that is the inferior vena cava, and then this one over here is the esophageal hiatus. If you remember from the previous video, uh, we have the esophagus right here, and the vagus nerves, left and right, travel very closely to that esophagus. Now, in this picture, the esophagus has been cut off here, but it actually goes down a lot further. Okay, so the vagus nerves travel very closely to the esophagus. Remember, the esophagus eventually is going to cross the diaphragm, and then it's going to merge into the stomach. Right? So the esophagus is actually pretty long, and the vagus nerves go with it all the way. And as the vagus nerves go with that esophagus, they form a plexus around the esophagus called the esophageal plexus. And in that plexus, some of the left vagus nerve intermixes with the right, and some of the right vagus nerve intermixes with the left. And so there is some crossover of some of the fibers. Now, at the very end of the last video, we talked about how as the vagus nerve descends down, uh, it eventually changes names to a vagal trunk. This one is the posterior vagal trunk. If we zoom in over here, you'll see this one cut off from the top. This is the anterior vagal trunk. So what's the difference between these two? Well, the anterior vagal trunk, this one right here, is actually mostly the left vagus nerve, a cranial nerve 10. But because of that, intermingling of the two vagus nerves in the esophageal plexus, uh, this one has some right contribution. This one over here, the posterior vagal trunk, which uh, you can see coming down here, this is mostly the right vagus nerve, although it does have some left contribution. So again, posterior is mostly right, anterior is mostly left, but they do have contributions from the contralateral vagus nerve. Let's first talk about the anterior vagal trunk. So the anterior vagal trunk is going to give off a couple of branches. The first one is a hepatic branch, which, as you might guess, serves the liver, providing parasympathetic action at the liver. Now, if we think of parasympathetic action for this video, it's really your rest and digest. Well, parasympathetic function, therefore, will stimulate the liver because if we rest and digest, that's going to promote GI function. So the liver will be stimulated by parasympathetic function or the vagus nerve. Another branch that comes off of the anterior vagal trunk is the anterior gastric branch. This one is obviously going to supply the stomach, but it's going to supply the anterior part of the stomach mostly. Now the anterior gastric branch is going to give off another major branch, which we're going to come back to in just a minute. Now over here, the posterior vagal trunk, remember that was mostly the right vagus nerve, but it does have some contributions from the left. The posterior vagal trunk gives off a branch, and that's the posterior gastric branch, which also serves the stomach like the anterior one. Uh, it just serves the posterior part of the stomach mostly. Now if we look at these two gastric branches, the anterior one and the posterior one, they're going to come together and actually contribute to what we call a celiac branch. The celiac branch will continue down to an enlargement called the celiac ganglion, which then forms what we call a celiac plexus. 
The celiac plexus itself gives rise to a bunch of other plexuses which serve individual structures, and that's far too complicated to go over, but those structures include the spleen, there's a plexus that serves the kidneys and the adrenal glands, which are also called uh, the suprarenal glands. Stomach, pancreas, liver. Uh, the celiac plexus is the main uh, nerve supply of the liver for the parasympathetic nervous system, but remember the hepatic branch of the anterior vagal trunk also supplies the liver. And then we also have intestines and the testicles and the ovaries depending on gender. The one that supplies the intestines you might have heard of, that's called the superior mesenteric plexus, but that's not super important right now. So if we go back to this picture, we can actually follow along with that a little bit. We see a celiac branch right here. This is the celiac branch from the posterior vagal trunk, but there would also be a celiac branch um, from the anterior vagal trunk. Okay, So there's your celiac branch. It's forming the celiac ganglia and the plexuses. And this celiac ganglion and plexus kind of lie in front of the abdominal aorta. And you can see the various branches going to the spleen. You can see branches going to the kidneys. This one going down would be the superior mesenteric plexus to the small intestine and also actually a little bit of the colon as well, in particular the cecum, ascending, and transverse colons. So that's the basic idea of the vagus nerve in the abdominal cavity. Now, the testicles in particular, which lie external, and the ovaries are more associated with the pelvic cavity, but by and large, there's really not much here for the pelvic cavity. So what's the parasympathetic control of those? Well, we're not going to go into those in much detail. I have a separate video covering that. But you'll notice that instead of the vagus nerve, which controls the vast majority of these things, there's also pelvic nerves that ultimately originate from the sacral region of the spinal cord. And that's where we get the uh, parasympathetic innervation of, let's say, the bladder and the urethra. There also is some communication with the penis and the scrotum and the uterus and the ovaries, although they clearly get some contribution from the vagus nerve via the celiac plexus. So hopefully that gave you a good overview of the vagus nerve's function in the abdominal cavity. In the next video, we're going to go over three specific nuclei all the way back in the medulla oblongata of the brainstem uh, that ultimately have a division of labor for the vagus nerve, the dorsal nucleus, nucleus ambiguous, and the solitary nucleus. So make sure to join us there. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.